all modern disease in this next 45 minutes. So we're going to have to try and do that by considering that I think the combination of sugar and particularly fructose refined carbohydrate and polyunsaturated oils combine together to be a toxic material. So I'm going to try and justify that by my model. I'm going to have to talk about an observation, some hypothesis, the mechanism, the pathophysiology, how to do it, some association evidence and intervention evidence. So here are a few observations. We got to the top of the food chain over two and a half million years by eating in one way. And I think we've been on a fad diet for the last 40 or 50 years and that social experiment is a clear failure and we're getting fatter and sicker than ever. So you've got to ask why. Obesity is increasing, cancer is increasing. I don't know if you don't, don't quite know what's happening in South Africa, but in Australia, children's cancer is going up 3% per annum, year in, year out. Osteoarthritis is increasing, joint disease is increasing. Gout has doubled in the last 10 years. You know, related to high levels of uric acid, and I'll explain that in a bit of biochemistry later. There's doubling rate of gout, despite the fact that we're actually eating less, re le less red meat and drinking less alcohol. Autoimmune disease, also increasing. Mental health, increasing burden, and the spectrum is right from autism right through to dementia. On and on and on. Every condition, every subspecialty, there's an increasing rate of problems. Welcome to modern disease. So what does medicine do about it? It's highly reactive. It doesn't think about the cause, it just throws pills at it. Focuses on the disease rather than the cause. And that's coming at a massive personal and medical cost to society. Our hospitals are bursting at the seams and with a lot of junk food within them. It's financially unsustainable. There's a lot of talk about when that point will be. I looked at this, um, I gave a paper about four or five years ago now on the economic cost of diabetes. I'm looking after well diabetic patients within the Australian system. I'm not talking about any complications, I'm not talking about an ulcer, I'm not talking about heart disease, anything. But looking after well diabetics, we will spend the entire Australian health budget looking after well diabetics within 20 years. Let's go back to the start. It really is our only option. So that's my observations. But I've got to come up with a hypothesis for you. So I think at the root cause of all disease is inflammation, whether or not it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. And you'll keep hearing those terms coming through over and over in the next few days. Now, if we can find out the cause of that inflammation, then we're on the very first step to prevention. And maybe we've got a new handle on modern disease. So, clearly inflammation's there. What's the cause of that inflammation? I need to find that toxic material, and in my mind, my hypothesis rests that it's a combination of fructose, refined carbohydrate, and polyunsaturated oils. But as quite rightly has been said, I think you know, it's not just that. I think that's the big print. If we get that big picture stuff together, clearly other stuff's involved. If you develop a susceptible organ, because it's chronically inflamed, then the other things come in. And that's when cortisol comes in. There are genetic predispositions. We heard about hyperlipidemia. All the chemicals that are floating around in society. There's an enormous amount of work being done on the gut biotome at the moment, trying to work out what that plays in there exercise or lack thereof can play a role. And we know there's associations with disease with latitude and longitude. Multiple sclerosis is quite common in Tasmania. So in a southern climate, where it's a lot, le a lot less common as you get towards the equator. We know that diabetes in the Polynesian islands increases that susceptibility as you go from west to east, as you travel further across the Pacific. So there's associations there. I always think that sleep's a factor, and I like to openly admit that I'm a clear hypocrite of that and I don't get enough. I'll explain where vitamin D comes in the equation. Even artificial lighting's been implicated in disease. We need to go back to the engine of the body. The engine of the cell is the mitochondria. It's the powerhouse. Most of you don't realise it's actually a hybrid engine. Most people, maybe not in this audience, but most people in society, have only been running along on one fuel tank on their glucose engine and they've been well and truly underutilising their ketone engine. But it is a hybrid engine. 
glucose, ketones. Both of those are converted in the mitochondria to acetyl-CoA and then into energy via the Krebs cycle. You get some glucose, stick it into a mitochondria and you get out some ATP, all right? About 36 for every unit of glucose. Ketones do the same thing, turn into acetyl-CoA. The mitochondria doesn't care whether you where the fuel source is for acetyl-CoA, as long as it gets it. And again, it converts it to ATP. There are only three primary colours, right? red, blue, yellow. And the combination of those makes up the entire colour spectrum. Well, guess what? There's only three primary foods. And combining them gives us the full spectrum of nutrition. That's how we combine them seasonally, that we can actually work out where our fuel sources are. So all foods are converted to energy in the mitochondria. Carbohydrate gets the big red one, protein the blue, and the fats yellow. The trick ins get the balance right between the three of them. And in nature, I think it's reflected in seasonal eating. Another way to look at all that fuel is carbohydrate, I think, is kindling. Little branches, you've got to put lots of them on regularly, you've got to get up and down, put from fire goes up, fire goes down, needs a lot of insulin, goes up, got to come down. It's a lot of work to keep carbohydrate going into your engine. Protein, I think, are like branches, and fats like slow burning logs. You put a slow burning log into the engine, low, slow fuel keeps us all going. So I'm going to dwell on each one of these. Carbohydrates are effectively either just glucose or fructose. Most of the glucose comes in either the, uh, the breads, the rice, the pastas, uh, the cereals, potato, uh, and the milk products in the lactose. Whereas fructose comes as, uh, in the form of either fruit or is in sugar. But they're all carbohydrates. Amylase breaks all of those carbohydrates down starting in your saliva, and by the time it reaches your gut, you've pretty well got a glucose load coming into the system. Sure, it's slowed by fibre content and decreases you, gives us a lower GI. But effectively, glucose is glucose. Right? It doesn't matter what form it comes in. It's metabolised pretty quickly. It goes from the gut under the influence of insulin, it's then distributed around the body. It goes to the brain, the liver, and the muscle. But it's been mentioned earlier today, so this is all those other pictures, the biochemical pathways you've seen earlier today, just in pictures because I find it a lot simpler. There's only about four grams in the blood supply at any point in time. So under the effect of insulin, it's distributed around the body, and if you have more than four grams, if you have more than one teaspoon, it gets distributed as fat. What does that mean if you have a, bowl, a piece of bread? Well, one slice of bread's got five teaspoons of sugar of glucose. One of them goes around your bloodstream, the other four go straight onto your backside. You have that bowl of pasta, 15 to 20 teaspoons of glucose. Right? One around the bloodstream, seven and a half on each cheek on the backside. Same thing goes with rice, even though old humble spud, one standard sized potato, about six teaspoons of glucose. Whereas sugar, fructose, we start looking at that a bit differently. Most of you are unaware that and certainly I was, in my training, I had no idea what happened to fructose, but it was actually only described pretty well definitively in 2010 by Look Tappy. So anybody talks to me about biochemistry and they haven't quoted beyond 2010, they're out of date. Um, so that puts virtually every guideline talking about sugar out of date because none have really been published much since 2010. So fructose is not just half of sugar, it's found in fruit, found in honey, high fructose corn syrup, about 55% fructose. And I have a problem with fruit. I have a website called No Fructose. And it's a regular question. We all get that question, what about fruit? And I look and say, it's really simple. Fruit nowadays has been manufactured with less fibre in it and more sugar. It improves shelf life and transportability. So a lot of our fruit's manufactured. It's treated in chemicals, gassed, before it ever gets near us.